Late one night in November of 1999, a 66-year-old minister named Colin Grant opened up the iron gates of a cemetery called Greyfriars Kirkyard. The cemetery was one of the oldest and most famous cemeteries in Edinburgh, Scotland. Now, the cemetery was basically pitch black. However, there were a few old iron lanterns that lined the cobblestone path that cut through the cemetery. And so Colin pushed open these big gates and he stepped onto this path and he began walking. And on either side of him, for as far as he could see, were all these headstones, some of which dated back to the 1600s. And as he kept walking, he could see up ahead, even in the darkness, the huge Gothic style church that sat right in the center of the cemetery. Now, at first glance, this cemetery just kind of looked like a pretty typical old cemetery, albeit a pretty spooky one. But to Colin, he knew there was far more than just a graveyard here. Deep underground in the cemetery, below where all the people have been buried at their headstones, was basically another cemetery. There was like this mass burial pit that the cemetery had been built on top of. And in this lower level cemetery, which in no way was marked, I mean, this is basically a hidden mass burial, were thousands of people who had been starved and tortured to death hundreds of years ago. And so Colin stopped for a second on the path and just kind of stared ahead at this church. And for a second, he thought about just turning and leaving because he did not want to be here. He was really only here because the city had begged him to come here. Colin, in addition to being a minister, claimed to be a psychic, which meant he could speak to the dead. And so the city, in desperation, had asked him to come to this cemetery tonight and perform an exorcism. And so as much as Colin did just want to turn around and leave, he knew he really had a duty here, not just to the city, but really to the people of the city. Because if he didn't do this exorcism, there was a good chance more people were going to get hurt. The only thing that was making Colin a little bit less afraid in this moment was he actually was not alone in the cemetery. There were two people with him. There was a journalist and a photographer from a local newspaper who were basically tagging along to document this exorcism. And so after taking a minute to compose himself, Colin continued walking deeper into the cemetery with these two following behind him. And then before reaching the big church, Colin left the path and began cutting through the grass, passing by different headstones on the way to perhaps the most infamous building in the entire cemetery, the Black Mausoleum. The Black Mausoleum was this tall stone crypt with a rounded top that had been built sometime in the late 1600s. And as Colin got closer to this pretty creepy looking building that sat basically on the side of the cemetery, Colin began to feel this really intense sense of dread come over him. And the closer he got, that dread began to kind of manifest itself in like a pit in his stomach. And eventually he began feeling really scared of this building. And eventually Colin actually had to fully stop about 10 or so feet away from the building because because he just felt like he couldn't go any closer. It felt evil. And then Colin turned and looked at his companions, the journalist and photographer, to see if maybe they were reacting to this mausoleum. But the two of them were just standing there with blank expressions on their face, like obviously not thinking that anything sinister was happening here. You know, even though the city had asked the minister to be here to perform this exorcism in this mausoleum, you know, it didn't mean everybody believed what was going on here. And clearly these two didn't. They were totally skeptical. But this didn't offend Colin. He was used to people not believing in the things he believed in. And he knew as soon as he actually began his work, you know, doing this exorcism, they would change their mind. And so at some point, Colin told the photographer that, hey, you know, I'm going to go in the mausoleum now because I have to do the exorcism. Before I do, take a picture of the mausoleum. And so the photographer just raised her camera and took a picture of the mausoleum. Colin thanked her, and then he turned and began walking towards the building. And when he got right in front of it, he looked up and he read the name across the top of the crypt. And it said, George McKenzie. And as Colin read that, he could feel his heart rate start to spike. So back in the late 1600s, George Mackenzie was a Scottish Lord who worked for the King of England, enforcing the King's religious laws. But at the time, these laws were very unpopular. And there was one group called the Covenanters who hated these laws so much that they actually mounted a full-scale rebellion in 1679. But their rebellion failed miserably, and this is when George Mackenzie came in. He captured over a thousand Covenanters and he marched them all into this huge field, which would later become the Greyfriars Kirkyard Cemetery, but at the time it was just a big open field, and he held them there. And for weeks, he had these people starved and tortured and mutilated. And if anybody tried to run or resist because they knew they were doomed, I mean, they all knew they were going to die here, 
If anybody took off, he would capture them, cut their head off, and then place their head on a spike around the perimeter of this field. Until, after several weeks, the entire field is just ringed with decaying bodies and bloody heads on spikes. And so after a few months of this, basically everybody in that field had been murdered in some horrible way by George Mackenzie. And their bodies were all dumped into a mass grave in Greyfriars Kirkyard, then covered over, and then, you know, hundreds of years later, a proper cemetery would be built right on top of that mass grave. And then, when George Mackenzie died later on, I mean, he lived a normal, happy, full life after doing all these horrible things, they built him this beautiful mausoleum in Greyfriars Kirkyard. And so here's this horrible person, George Mackenzie, who's a mass murderer, and he's put to rest in this beautiful mausoleum, just, you know, feet away from this mass grave of all these people he killed. For almost 300 years after Mackenzie was buried, Greyfriars Kirkyard was quiet. It was not considered a haunted place. That all changed, though, in 1998, so that was one year before Colin showed up to perform this exorcism. That year, in 1998, a homeless man broke into the Black Mausoleum, and he fell through the floor and landed in one of those mass burial pits of those people Mackenzie had killed. And apparently, basically right after this happened, visitors to the cemetery began reporting the same thing, that any time they were in or near the Black Mausoleum, they'd get pushed or tugged on or scratched or burned or even strangled. I mean, people were coming out of the cemetery terrified. And so quickly, people in town began to speculate about, you know, what was going on in the cemetery. And quickly, a story began to circulate around town that maybe when that guy fell through the floor in the mausoleum, that that had released George Mackenzie's evil spirit, and his spirit was responsible for all these attacks. And so it went on like this for about a year, until finally, this young woman was found outside of the Black Mausoleum, unconscious, looking like she'd been strangled, and when she came to, she had no memory of what happened, and so people assumed this had to be another attack by the spirit of George Mackenzie. And so by this point, the city was totally fed up with this, they didn't know what to do, and so they said, you know what, let's just try an exorcism. Let's have someone go into to that mausoleum and literally confront the spirit of George Mackenzie and banish him. Get him out of here and stop this madness. And so ultimately Colin was hired to perform this exorcism. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's video. As a kid, whenever I had something on my mind, I would just go talk to my parents or my siblings about it. It was normal. You just talked about your feelings. But in 2017, when I was an adult and I had just gotten out of the military and I was really struggling mentally because I just could not quite adjust getting back into civilian life. I definitely was dealing with some PTSD and I was definitely depressed. You know, I had things going on, but I just couldn't talk to someone about it. It was like I lost the ability to just talk about my feelings. And so I ended up bottling up all these horrible thoughts I was having, and I began lashing out at everybody in my life. And eventually it got to a place where I actively thought, you know, I think my family would be better off without me here. But luckily my family would intervene because they saw me totally spiraling and they encouraged me to go seek out professional help. And I'm glad I did because I really think that actually saved my life. Now, while therapy is not a one size fits all solution, I believe it really is a great starting point for anybody who's struggling. And a great option for therapy that's very accessible is better help. BetterHelp is entirely online, which means you can get the help you need right from the comfort of your own home. All you have to do is fill out a quick survey online, and then you'll be matched up with a licensed therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. Let BetterHelp connect you to a therapist who can support you right from the comfort of your own home. Visit betterhelp.com slash mrballin or select Mr. Ballin during sign up and enjoy a special discount on your first month. As Colin stood there, you know, reading the name George McKenzie and mentally preparing himself to go inside of this horrible place, he realized he just couldn't do it. This was too much. And so Colin is just standing there feeling totally stressed out. He's embarrassed. He feels like a coward. He has no idea what he's going to say to the photographer and journalist who've literally come out here to document what he's going to do, and now he's not going to do it. But as Colin turned around to basically blurt out this really embarrassing news that, hey guys, we got to leave, 
he realized he actually knew something else he could do that in many ways might actually be better than going into this mausoleum and doing an exorcism. And so without saying anything, Colin just turned and began speed walking over to this big field that was not too far away from the Black Mausoleum. And when he got there, he just began chanting prayers and walking in circles, flicking holy water, didn't explain anything he was doing to the journalist and the photographer who'd followed him over there and are just watching him like, what's going on here? They got no idea. He's not clarifying. And for hours, this is what he did. He just kind of paced in this field, you know, just kind of doing what looked like stereotypical, you know, exorcism type behavior. And that's what the journalist and the photographer assumed he was doing. And so as Colin did whatever he was doing in this field, the photographer, whose name was Susan Burrell, just began doing her job, you know, again, thinking that he was doing the exorcism. And so she just started taking pictures of him. And then finally, around 2 a.m., so again, this has been hours of Colin doing this thing he's doing, Colin just abruptly stops and walks over to Susan and the journalist, and Colin looks horrible. He's totally haggard, his hair's all disheveled, he's sweating, he's pale, and his head is down, and he says to the two women, I failed. He explained to them that his original intention was to go into the Black Mausoleum and confront George McKenzie's spirit head on and banish him from the cemetery. However, he had had a change of heart at the door and decided to go this other route, which was to go to this big open field in the middle of the cemetery and attempt to free the spirits of all those Covenanters who had been tortured and killed by George McKenzie. Colin's thinking was, you know, if I can free all of these poor tortured souls, that maybe once they're gone, George McKenzie's spirit will also go away. And while, according to Colin, he was able to free, you know, 200 some odd trapped souls, he said there were many more that still needed to be freed, and he just didn't have the strength. Like, he couldn't do this right now. And so he said, you know, I have to rest and do this at another time. Now, the journalist and the photographer were totally over this and did not care at all. It's 2 a.m., they don't really understand what he was doing, they don't really know if this was the exorcism or if it was something else, but to them, they're like, okay, fine, we'll get out of here, it's late, it's not a big deal. And so the three of them, they began walking out of the cemetery, and right when they got in front of the church, so basically between where the Black Mausoleum was and where that field was, where Colin had been for the past several hours, Colin abruptly stopped, and he told the journalist and the photographer that actually, you know what? He had a little strength left, and he felt like it was his duty to try this again, because he knew he could free more souls, and so he was gonna give it another go. And so the journalist and the photographer are like, Okay. And so Colin, you know, he gets out his Bible and he begins kind of doing the same thing he was doing out in the field, you know, walking around, chanting Bible verses, spraying holy water all around. And then at some point, for reasons he did not explain to either Susan or the journalist, he pulled out 12 candles from his backpack that he had brought along and he put them in a circle on the ground right in front of this church. It also encompassed this big Celtic cross that was on the ground. And Colin was inside of the circle and he lit all these candles and the whole time again, you know, he's chanting out these Bible verses and he stands up and right after all the candles have been lit, suddenly Susan and the journalist noticed that the candles begin to flicker. And it's not windy at all inside the cemetery. Like they shouldn't be flickering. And at the same time, Colin seemed to sense that something was happening around him and he turned his whole body, his whole presence, and he looked over at the Black Mausoleum and began chanting these Bible verses louder and louder like he was aiming them at the Black Mausoleum. And as he was doing this, the candles were flickering more and more and more. And at some point, Colin actually picked up one of these candles and kind of held it out at the Black Mausoleum. And so at this point, the journalist and the photographer, Susan, they're sensing that something weird is happening here. Like, this is spooky, what they're seeing. Like, why are the candles flickering? What's going on with Colin? Like, what's happening here? And for a minute, the two of them kind of abandoned their actual job, which is to document what they're seeing. And they just stood there kind of witnessing this totally bizarre event. But then Susan sort of broke out of it, she lifted up her camera, and right as Colin is passionately chanting out these verses, she takes a picture of him, and the second she does, the flash lights up the cemetery, and then after the flash goes away, Colin, it was like the light went out on him, and he just crumpled to the ground. And so the journalist immediately ran over to Colin to see if he was okay, and Colin, who's like barely conscious at this point, he just kept repeating, this is going to kill me, this is going to kill me. 
And so Susan was about to run over and join her colleague and make sure Colin was okay, but before she did, she glanced down at her camera to see the picture she had taken of Colin right before he collapsed. And as she glanced at it, she couldn't believe what she was looking at. At first she thought, you know, maybe this is some trick of the light, like this can't be right. But then she zoomed in on the photo, and when she looked closely, she screamed. Here's the photograph that Susan took. As you can see, Colin the minister is standing there with the candle outstretched, and behind him is the big church, and on the church, on the left side, there are windows. Now, this church was locked up. Nobody was inside the church at the time. But you can clearly see in the left window, there is a figure in that window looking out at Colin. Now, of course, this is not evidence enough to make everybody believe that, oh, that must be George McKenzie's spirit staring out at Colin. He's the reason Colin collapsed. But I'll tell you, this photograph is not the end of the story. Remember, after Colin collapsed to the ground, after this photo was taken, the journalist ran over, and all Colin kept saying was, this is gonna kill me, this is gonna kill me. Well, it would turn out, he'd be right. Not long after this failed exorcism, Colin would die inexplicably. His death would come as a total shock to his friends and family. No one has ever been able to debunk the photo that Susan took that showed that dark figure in the window of the church, meaning nobody knows what that was. The church really was supposed to be empty and locked, and so how is there somebody or something in the window? Nobody knows. A lot of people think that could be the evil spirit of George McKenzie, you know, striking Colin down, and Susan managed to capture it on film but you know, it's up to you if you believe that or not. But I will say to this day, people go into that cemetery and come out with scratch marks on them and you know, claiming they were pushed or pulled or strangled. And so that cemetery is considered to be one of the most haunted places in the world. And George McKenzie's spirit, who supposedly haunts it, is considered to be one of the most dangerous poltergeists in the world as well. In 2003, Kevin Manis owned an antique shop right in downtown Portland at the base of the Burnside Bridge, which is considered the gateway to the city. Because Kevin owned this antique shop, he was always at yard sales and estate sales looking to find the next thing he could sell at his shop. And so one day there was this estate sale over at this woman's house. She had just passed away. She was about 103 years old. She was a Holocaust survivor and her estate was being sold. And so he goes over to the house and he sees the way they're selling all of her items is by bundling them in different lots. So depending on what item it was, they'd be bundled with similar items and then sold as a package. So the people there would be bidding on the whole lot. They couldn't buy individual items. And Kevin had his eye on one particular lot called lot 29 and lot Lot 29 included a couple of small tools that he wanted to sell in his shop and it had this mystery box and that's exactly as it was labeled. It just says mystery box on it and he was intrigued by it. And so he placed a bid on lot 29 and ultimately he won the bid and he was really happy about it. So he takes the contents of lot 29 and he wheels them over to his car. And as he's loading stuff into the back of his car, someone behind him says, oh, so you went with the Dybbuk box, huh? And Kevin in his head went right back to his childhood because growing up, he had always been scared of Dybbuk's because a Dybbuk is a malevolent spirit in Jewish folklore and Kevin was Jewish and so his parents used to say oh you better not do that Kevin or the Dybbuk's gonna get you and so he grew up terrified of Dybbuk's and so his interest is peaked and Kevin turns around and he says did you just call this box a Dybbuk box and the woman's like yeah and my grandmother was terrified of it and she said no one could ever open it and Kevin turns to look at the box and it's about two foot high by one foot wide and there are these little doors that swing open on the front and then on the bottom there's a drawer that comes out and there's one lock that sits across the two doors and it's currently locked with a little padlock and he looks up at her and he goes why can't you open it and the woman just says we never knew but our grandmother would always go every time we said the word Dybbuk, and so it was weird enough that we just never asked any questions and we stayed away from her Dybbuk box. Kevin agreed that was pretty weird, and he finished loading his car, shut the trunk, said bye to the woman, hopped in his car, and he drove away, and he never really gave it a second thought. At this point, he's not thinking the Dybbuk box is anything malevolent. He thinks it's just some random chest 
that he won at an auction. Kevin drives back to his antique shop and he begins unloading all the things he won at the auction. He brings them inside and he brings them downstairs because the top floor, the main floor, was really where he sold things. When he got new items, he would bring them downstairs to his warehouse of sorts, which was much bigger than the first floor, had lots of rows of shelving and it had a, a workstation down there. He would bring his new things down there and he would price them and get them ready before bringing them back up. And at some point he brought the Dybbuk box in and he brought it down and he put it on the back table. He was about to just leave it there and go back upstairs when suddenly he became really curious and he really wanted to open the Dybbuk box. And so he goes over and he kind of yanks on the front two doors. He doesn't want to damage it, but he can tell this lock is relatively new and it's not just going to come off. And so he doesn't have the key to it and he doesn't have a way to clip the lock. And so he takes a screwdriver and he basically wedges it underneath the actual metal clasps that are attached to the wood. And he slowly kind of bends it up and bends it off and pops it out of the wood. And as soon as he does that, the doors swing open and there's like a mechanical device inside of the Dybbuk box that activates the drawer. Basically, anytime the doors open, the drawer also opens at the same time. And Kevin remembered thinking how silly it was that this kind of old, crummy looking wine closet had this fairly complicated mechanism inside of it that still worked. Inside the Dybbuk box were two pennies from the 1920s, there was a used candle, there were two locks of hair, there was this small tombstone that said Shalom on it, and there was also a small wine goblet that was inside, and that was it. And Kevin immediately thought, well, this is just some older woman's keepsake, and these things maybe have sentimental value to her, but they don't to me. And so he shut the Dybbuk box, pushed it to the side of the desk, and walked upstairs and didn't give it another thought. Kevin had one employee at the antique shop. Her name was Jane. She was a younger woman. She was an incredible saleswoman and Kevin thought very highly of her. And so the day after he had brought the Dybbuk box into the antique shop and put it downstairs on the desk, he needed to run out and do some errands and so he put Jane in charge of the store. And so Kevin leaves and Jane locks the front door to the shop behind Kevin because she needed to go downstairs and get a few items that she wanted to bring upstairs to sell that day and it was before opening time. So front door's locked, no one else is inside the shop, and Jane goes down into the basement. Once you went down the wooden steps into the basement, you'd be looking out at this huge room of all these industrial shelves that run the length of the room where they would keep their antiques and other valuables on. And the lighting down there was never that great because they used these long fluorescent tube lights that at best cast a kind of subtle yellow glow on everything. They were not particularly bright and it was a real pain to actually go up and change them because you needed to place a ladder, but the ladders were not perfectly aligned with the lights. You basically had to reach over the shelving where all the antiques were, and you ran the risk of knocking things over. And so a lot of times, Jane and Kevin would wait until you were down to like one or two crappy working lights before they'd say, okay, we really gotta go up there and replace some of these bulbs. And so as it happens this day, they're down to like two or three working lights. So in classic horror movie fashion, she's going into this dingy basement with very poor lighting. And so once she gets to the bottom of the steps, she walks to the far end of the room, a little bit away from where the Dybbuk box was placed on that back table. She's in the other corner in the back of this basement and she's getting some things off the shelf when all of a sudden she stops and she can't help but shake the feeling that she feels like someone is watching her. Now, she is down in this basement all the time, whether it's well lit or dark, whether Kevin is there with her or she's alone, this is a place she goes all the time, and she's never had this feeling before. There's no way to get into the basement unless you come down the stairs, and she locked the front door, and she was the only one who came downstairs. She hasn't heard anything. There's no other way to leave this space. So she doesn't know where she's getting this feeling from, but she really can't shake it. And as she's kind of looking around and she's starting to get a little bit paranoid, the phone rings. They had a landline that was on a table right at the base of the stairs. The phone rings down there and it startles her. And then it kind of jumps her back into reality. And she's like, okay, I'm getting paranoid. And she walks over and she picks up the phone and it's actually her friend who was planning on coming by the antique shop that day. So as they're chatting, Jane hears what sounds like a broom. Imagine if a, a push broom is lined up against the wall and then it falls over, the sound that the wooden stick would make as it hits concrete. That's the sound she hears as she's on the phone. And it startles her again and she goes, hey, let me call you back. She hangs up on her friend and she's looking out 
And because the lighting is terrible from where she is, she's now at the foot of the stairs looking down all these rows and she's heard that stick land on the ground on the far side back where she had been originally. She's kind of looking around and she can't see anything. And so she takes a deep breath and she begins walking down the rows to see what fell over. And as she's walking down the row, something smashes behind her and she turns around and one of the fluorescent tube lights has fallen from the ceiling and smashed onto the ground. And so all of a sudden she doesn't want to explore this falling broom that's behind behind her in the dark corner of the basement. Instead, she's ready to leave. And so she starts walking back towards the stairs to get out of here. And as she's walking down one of these rows, a wooden chair that is on one of the shelves comes flying off of it and lands squarely in the middle, blocking her path. And there's no way this could have happened unless someone pushed this chair and suddenly she thinks someone's down here with me and she screams and she hurdles the chair and she runs to the steps she starts running up and to her horror there is a metal door that locks the basement at night so if someone were to break in it's another layer to protect the store from thieves and it was shut and locked it can only be locked from the outside and with a key. So there's no way she would have done this by accident. And now she's freaking out because she's trapped in the basement with some person running around, pushing chairs over and breaking lights. And so she grabs the gate and she starts shaking it and she's yelling for Kevin, thinking maybe he came in and forgot I was down here and shut and locked the gate. And she's checking over her shoulder, looking down into the basement and she starts hearing more lights falling off the ceiling and shattering on the ground. She is in absolute panic mode. She's just waiting for someone to come bounding up the stairs towards her. She has no idea what to do. She pulls out her phone and she calls Kevin. Meanwhile, Kevin is making his way back to the antique shop. He's only a couple minutes away and he sees his phone ringing that was sitting on the passenger seat and he picks it up and it's Jane and he answers and immediately Jane is hysterical and she's screaming that someone's in the antique shop that's breaking things and Kevin's like, slow down, slow down, what's going on? And all he can hear in the background is the sound of what sounds like glass shattering and things falling and breaking. Breaking. And he's like, wait, what's going on? Are you okay, Jane? Like, where are you? And he hears her say, someone's in the basement. And he goes, well, where are you? And she's like, I'm in the basement. And he was like, get out of the basement, call the police. But as he's trying to get her to do that, the phone cuts out. Kevin was only about a block away from his shop. So he floors it to his shop. He parks outside and he's thinking to himself, what am I walking into? Is there going to be like an active burglary going on? Is she going to be held hostage? Like, are the police going to be there? But he just knows he needs to get in there to Jane and he gets to the front door and it's locked. So he unlocks the front door and he goes inside and it's silent. And he's looking around. There's no damage to the first floor. There's no damage anywhere. And he yells for Jane. There's no answer from Jane. And he starts walking kind of tentatively through the store towards the back. And he gets to that door leading down into the basement, the same one that Jane couldn't open when she ran up the stairs to get out of the basement. And he looks at it and Jane's not at the top of the stairs anymore. And he's thinking, I didn't lock that door and I'm the only one with the key to lock that door. How is it locked right now? Does Jane have a key that I don't know about? And why would she lock it? Does that mean Jane's up here somewhere? Is that what happened? And he's like, Jane, come out. Did you lock this door? But Jane's not on the first floor and their first floor is very small. And so he thinks, okay, she has to be downstairs. And so he opens up the gate, he swings it open and he starts walking down the steps. And he's really cautious as he's going down because again, he has no idea what he's walking into. He hits the lights, but the lights don't work down there. And as he starts to bend around the corner where he can actually see into the basement, he sees Jane sitting at the chair right next to that table where that phone is. And she's just sitting there kind of stunned. And he goes to Jane and he's like, what happened down here? And he glances out quickly at all the rows and he sees all this furniture that's come off the shelves and there's glass all over the ground. And he's looking at Jane and Jane's just showing no reaction. She's sitting there like she's in shock. And he turns to Jane again and he says, come on, you gotta tell me what happened down here. And Jane just goes, I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain what happened down here. I was walking down the row and then I felt like someone was watching me and then things are falling off the ceiling and the shelves. I've never seen anything like this before. Now at this point, Kevin's adrenaline is through the roof. He came charging in here thinking he was gonna have to save Jane from some person breaking in and breaking stuff. But as far as he can tell, there's no one here but Jane. And so he decides he's gonna take a flashlight and he's gonna explore the basement because Either there's someone here or Jane did this. So he grabs his flashlight and he starts walking around and all he sees is a bunch of broken glass and some furniture that's come off the shelves and a couple other things that are on the ground. But other than that, there's no one down here and there's no other way to come in or out of here besides the stairs. So after Kevin is certain that no one else is here, 
he turns to Jane and he regrets this now. He says in an interview that he feels horrible about this now, but at the time he's thinking to himself, you know, this had to have been Jane. Who else would have done this? I don't know why she did this, but there's no one else here. And he goes, Jane, did you do this? And this is when Jane's emotions came through because before she was in shock, now she's mad. And she goes, F you, Kevin. And she leaves and she doesn't say another word to him and she doesn't come back. She quits on the spot. But at the time, Kevin believed she had done it. So he was kind of like, oh well. He was not even a little bit thinking the Dybbuk box had anything to do with this. Just a couple of days after the basement incident, Kevin's mother was supposed to come by the antique shop and the two of them were gonna leave and get lunch together to celebrate her birthday. As soon as she walked into the shop, Kevin goes, hey mom, I got a gift for you. And he brings over this wrapped box and he sets it down on a table right in front of his mother who's sitting on a chair. And he unwraps it and it's the Dybbuk box. Before Kevin can explain what it is, the phone rings at the other end of the store and he was expecting a call and he goes, hold on mom, I gotta get this. And he goes to the back of the store to answer the call while his mom is just sitting there looking at the box. And so while Kevin is at the other end of the store, his mother opens the Dybbuk box and she says she had to sit down as soon as she opened it because she had this unbelievable, overwhelming sense of dread as soon as the doors were open. And she's staring at it like she can't take her eyes away. And then all of a sudden she has a massive stroke. And so she keels over and she can't move and she can't talk. And Kevin sees this happening. He runs over and he's like, mom, what's going on? He calls 911. And as the paramedics are working on her, she would say that while she was in this kind of paralyzed state when she couldn't talk and she couldn't move, all she wanted to communicate was to somehow get her son to get rid of that box. She didn't know why, but she felt like the box had something to do with her having the stroke. And so all she could do was move her eyes. And so she found herself, because her son's right here, looking at the Dybbuk box and looking away, looking at the Dybbuk box, looking away, hoping her son would see her eyes as a signal to look at the Dybbuk box and put it together that that thing's bad. And Kevin does realize that his mom is flicking her eyes at the Dybbuk box, but in the moment, he's much more concerned about the health of his mother. And it wasn't until she got put in a hospital and she was being taken care of and he knew she'd be okay, then he remembers, he kind of went over it in his head later that day, that his mom was really scared looking and she was looking at the Dybbuk box, like that was the thing that was causing her to be scared. Not the stroke, the Dybbuk box. And Kevin starts thinking to himself, I don't know, there's something off about the Dybbuk box. Either it's really bad luck or there's some truth to you don't open up this Dybbuk box. Either way, I don't want to take any more chances because so long as I've owned this thing, I've had a horrible thing happen in the basement and now my mom's had a stroke. So I wanna get rid of it. So Kevin puts the Dybbuk box at the front of his antique store and he puts it up for sale. And very quickly, a young couple came into the store and they bought the Dybbuk box. And Kevin's relieved, he's like, thank goodness, that bad luck charm, that whatever's going on with that thing is gone and out of my life. But just a couple of days later, he was in the back of the shop when he heard the door open and then the door shut and he walked out expecting to see some customers, but instead he sees the Dybbuk box that's sitting right inside his store. Someone must have just dropped it off. And so he walks up to it and he sees there's a piece of paper that's been taped to the top of the Dybbuk box and there's writing on it. And all it says is, this has an odd darkness about it. This really freaked Kevin out because in a way it was like other people were confirming that something was wrong with this box. Kevin did not want the Dybbuk box to be in his store. So he put it in his car and he drove back to his house and he put it in his storage locker and he locked it up and then went back to work for the day. That night when he went home, he went to bed and he had this dream where in the dream, he's walking in this courtyard and he's holding the hand of this woman who he believes is his friend and he trusts this person and the area he's in feels very friendly and it's a very positive dream. And as he's walking, all of a sudden, this person starts to pull away from him and he can't move anymore and he's, he's losing the grip on this person's hand and they keep moving and moving until their hand is out of his and they disappear into the corner of the courtyard where it's totally dark. And so he's looking into the darkness, waiting for his friend to come out again and he he can't move, he's anchored to the spot. And as he's looking, he sees what looks like an old woman walking out of the mist and her head is down and he can't tell what she's doing. And she's pretty far away and she's walking closer and closer to him. And when she's about 
five, six feet away, she raises her head up and her whole face is falling off. All the skin is falling off of her face. It's rotting. She's like a corpse. And she raises her hands up in front of her. Then she grabs his face and begins pulling off pieces of his face until he suddenly wakes up. Kevin had to compose himself in bed because he was so scared from the dream he just had. He sits up and he goes into the bathroom to get a sip of water. And as he walks past the mirror, he notices there are marks on his shoulders and his arms that he did not have before. It looks like bruising almost. And he's looking at them and he's thinking, no way. That, that has nothing to do with the dream. This is just coincidence that, you know, she was grabbing me in this area in the dream and now I have marks there. It's just coincidence. And so he kind of writes it off and he goes back to bed and he has the same dream. He gets up again and he's, he's breathing heavily. He's sweating because he just had the same dream. It was this terrifying dream. And he goes back into the bathroom and now his entire back is covered in bruises. He has bruises all over his back, all over his arms. He's got red marks on his neck. And now in his mind, he feels like it has to do with the Dybbuk box. The Dybbuk box is now in my backyard. It's not a coincidence that all of a sudden I'm having these horrific dreams that are apparently manifesting themselves in bruises and marks on my actual body. And so Kevin is done with the Dybbuk box and instead of going back to bed, he goes to his computer and he puts the Dybbuk box on eBay up for sale. And that night, two college kids named Sam and Brian who lived in Missouri, they buy the Dybbuk box and Kevin could not be happier to package that thing up and ship it off. Sam and Brian had seen the ad on eBay for the Dybbuk box and at first it did not seem remarkable, but they saw that Kevin had given this really detailed description of all the strange things that had happened for him since he owned the Dybbuk box. And I think clearly Kevin's angle was he was almost trying to advertise it to groups of people that might be interested in that. And Sam and Brian were exactly that demographic because they were looking for things online that were considered haunted. They wanted to see if ghosts and the paranormal were real. And so they were eager to buy the Dybbuk box and test it out. And so three weeks later, when this package finally arrives in Missouri at their house, Brian was still out at class, but Sam was home. So he receives the package. He eagerly brings it into the kitchen. He unpackages it and he sets it on the kitchen table. And just a few minutes later, Brian comes home and Brian would say in interviews that when he walked in, it smelled like someone had peed all over the apartment. Like there was urine everywhere. And he's walking around thinking, what happened? This smells so bad in here. And he walks into the kitchen where it was the strongest smell. And there's Sam proudly standing next to this awful looking chest, which was of course the Dybbuk box. And he realizes, Brian does, that the Dybbuk box is what smells like urine. And he goes, Sam, do you smell that? And Sam's like, yeah, that's the smell of ghosts. Sam would pick it up and go, ooh, to Brian as soon as he walked into the kitchen. And Sam joked about how he couldn't wait to sleep in the same bed as the Dybbuk box. They were just making a big joke out of it. Sam had also set up a blog where he was going to document everything that happened from day one of receiving this Dybbuk box to whenever they got rid of it or till whenever something happened. And for the first two weeks they had the Dybbuk box in their possession, nothing did happen. But when Sam started bringing the Dybbuk box out and leaving it right in the middle of these huge parties they would throw where people were spilling beer on it and they were opening it up and putting things inside of it and making jokes with it. When they were doing that to the Dybbuk box, suddenly they started seeing a pretty significant uptick in strangeness inside of their house. It started with their technology. Sam's laptop crashed and the hard drive was unrecoverable. So he had to replace his laptop. All of their watches just didn't work while they were in the house. No matter what they did, no matter when they fixed it, the watch just simply did not work. Their Xbox would not turn on, but when they brought it to another person's house, it worked just fine. It just couldn't work inside of their house. And the toaster, anytime you turned it on, it basically immediately incinerated whatever you put inside of it. But none of these technological difficulties were frightening to Sam or Brian. They were just frustrating. And I don't even think they were connecting them with the Dybbuk box. It was just this thing that was happening to them. It wasn't until the light bulbs in their house started bursting in the middle of the night that they started to get pretty creeped out about some of the things that were happening in their apartment. That now all of a sudden it did seem like, you know, maybe if the Dybbuk box really is cursed, this might be how it would manifest. And so they'd replace the light bulb and then sure enough it would burst again. And they couldn't keep light bulbs in because they kept popping. And so their house was dark a lot of the time. But the worst part was when they had this massive insect infestation inside of their apartment. 
and they were really localized around the Dybbuk box. All these insects would come out of the walls, out of the toilets, out of the sink. They'd come from behind the fridge and they would all kind of like converge on the Dybbuk box and go inside of it. The Dybbuk box at one point was swarming with insects all over and they had to shut the door. They couldn't even go in the room with the Dybbuk box because it was just covered in insects. But despite how scary this was for the boys, they had become kind of like a cool talking point on campus because of Sam's blog that a lot of other students were following. And so the boys kind of liked the clout they got with that and they decided they didn't want to get rid of the box after all. But it wasn't long after the insect infestation that Sam began losing all of his hair. And at the same time, he started having this constant hallucination that there was an old woman in his peripheral vision on either side of his head, pretty much at all times. Anywhere he went, there basically was someone he couldn't quite see following him around. Whether he was well rested, whether he was totally exhausted, it didn't matter. He always saw this shrouded dark figure that he believed was an old woman and it scared him so much he couldn't sleep. And so he began going into Brian's room and sitting on Brian's bed because it was the one place he felt a little bit of comfort. And as he's sitting on the bed, he would see these dark figures standing on either side of him all night. And so finally, no matter how cool their blog was, it became too much and they decide we have to get rid of the Dybbuk box. And so they put it on eBay and very quickly it gets sold to a guy named Jason, who was this museum director over at this other university in Missouri. And he had actually been following along with Sam's blog. He was very interested in what was going on with the Dybbuk box. And when it was listed for sale, he was all over it. He wanted to buy it. So the boys eagerly ship off the Dybbuk box and Jason receives it in the middle of a work day. So he puts the package in his truck and he goes upstairs and he works for the day. And then afterwards, when everyone's left the office, he goes downstairs, gets the package, brings it back up to his office, puts it on his desk and he cuts open the packaging. Jason decided he wanted to evaluate the Dybbuk box the way he would evaluate any other antique or item that was coming into the museum that he was the director of. And so Jason starts by taking a whole bunch of pictures all around the outside of the Dybbuk box. And then he gets his black light out and he begins scanning around the outside and he finds all these traces of wax all over the outside, which leads him to believe this was probably used in some sort of ritual. And then he takes a deep breath and he sits down right in front of the Dybbuk box and he pops off the lock and he gets ready and he opens the doors and the drawer slides out with that whole mechanical device. It all kind of comes open and Jason's totally let down because nothing happens. And part of him thought like, if this thing is haunted, as soon as you open it up, the haunting's going to begin and nothing happened. And he's pretty let down about it. And so ultimately after staring at it and looking at the pennies that are in there and the, the, the Shalom statue and the locks of hair, he's just kind of let down by it. And he decides, okay, I kind of got my hopes up for something. This was clearly a hoax. There's nothing going on here. It's just, just a random old chest. And so he closes it up and he puts it on another desk that wasn't the one that he worked at, but was just kind of a, another table inside of this office that he shared with some other people. And he figured it would be a good talking point to tell his colleagues about, and it would be kind of like a showpiece. So the next day his colleagues come in and he explains what a Dybbuk box is and the history around it, that it's supposed to be haunted. And, you know, it makes people sick and gives people strokes. And, you know, there's been insects that have been known to come out of it and go into it. It's this very creepy thing. And his colleagues are like, wow, that's pretty cool but they don't think much of it until all of the electronics inside of their office start to fail. Namely, their computers start crashing and their IT department comes up and they're like, we don't know why this is happening, but sorry, we can't recover it. And the light bulbs kept going out to the point where they went out and got this huge pack of extra light bulbs to replace the light bulbs as they went out. Something they never had to do before, but all of a sudden the Dybbuk box is in the room and the light bulbs are going out left and right. And then finally, Jason's coworkers that share that space with the Dybbuk box, they all got sick and they blamed the Dybbuk box. They said, you know what? We were fine until that thing came in here. Now all of a sudden our computers don't work, the lights don't work and we're getting sick. Get rid of it, Jason. So that day after work, Jason goes and takes the Dybbuk box, puts it in the back of his truck and his truck had a cover on the back. So he secures it in the back, he drives home and he doesn't want to bring it inside because it just seemed weird to bring a cursed object inside that his coworkers just made him get out of their space because it was making them sick and it was ruining their things. So he thinks, okay, I'll leave it in my truck overnight and I'll figure out what I'm going to do with it tomorrow. He goes inside, he says hi to his family and before long it's time for bed and Jason goes to sleep. In order to understand what happened to Jason, you need to understand the layout of his house. 
When you open the front door, you walk inside and there's a wall on your right hand side. That's the side of the house. And you walk forward about five or six feet. And on your left is a staircase that goes up to the second floor. If you walk up that staircase, straight ahead of you is going to be a bathroom. If you go left and walk down the hall another five or six feet, you come to the master suite where Jason and his wife would sleep. If you walk through that door, there is a wall on your left where there's a big bay window that looks out onto the street. And there's a big street light that sits right outside that projects very orangey yellow light into their room at night. Even though they have a shade up, it's this orange glow that comes through this window right here on this side. And then on the other side of the room is the bed. And the bed is situated where the feet are pointed towards this window over here. And the head of the bed is against this wall. And it's centered on this wall here. And Jason, if you were looking overhead at the top of this bed, Jason's on the left side. So he's the farthest into his room and his wife is the closest into the room. So that night, Jason goes to bed and he falls asleep. But just a couple hours later, he wakes up suddenly and he can't move his body. He can only move his eyes. He's laying on his back and the light from the street light is very strong. It's this orangey glow in their whole room. And he's laying there trying to move his hands and his legs, but he can't do it. And as he's doing that, he starts hearing footsteps out on the stairs. And they're distinctive sounds, slow, plodding steps all the way up to the second floor. And Jason's laying here with his eyes looking towards the door because his door is open and he can barely see into the second floor landing. And he's waiting to see who came up the stairs. And his heart's racing and he's looking. And out of the corner of his eye, he sees what looks like a dark figure begin to walk into the room. And his heart starts racing even faster when he can tell it's definitely not someone he knows. It's this woman, this older woman with a shawl over her head and her head is tucked down so we can't see her and this is all out of the corner of his eye and because of the orange hue coming in from the window he can definitely tell that there is a real solid figure right there this is not in his imagination it's right there and this woman begins shuffling her way across the foot of the bed and right at the foot of the bed as jason's looking at her she turns and looks directly at him and then she runs around the corner and she looks down at him and she takes her fingers and she drives them into his eyes. And Jason thinks it's real and he's screaming in pain and he wakes up and his wife is grabbing him and she's like, Jason, Jason, what's wrong? And he's like, what's going on? And she says, honey, it's just a bad dream. You're fine. And he's shaken up. You know, his heart's still racing from this dream he's just had. And he's trying to think like that felt really real. And he's like feeling his eyes. And he can't believe that that was a dream. That was the most vivid dream he's ever had in his life. And so eventually he goes back to sleep. And then the next morning when he gets up, he goes in the bathroom and he looks at his eyes and they're all red around the outside. And the whites of his eyes are covered in blood. His eyes look horrible. Like he's having this terrible allergic reaction to something, or it looks like someone might've punched him in the eyes or maybe gouged his eyes. That's how it looks. And his wife comes in and she's like, what happened to you? And he's like, oh my God, I have no idea. It was around this time that Jason began to think the Dybbuk box might just be cursed because the two previous owners have said in their disclosures on eBay that horrible, vivid dreams, just like the one he had to include physical manifestations are part of having this Dybbuk box. Jason considered just dumping this thing in a dumpster somewhere, but then he was concerned that he might be passing on this Dybbuk box to someone who wasn't ready for it. And so he decided he would give it another day and he would do some research about how to properly dispose of a Dybbuk box. And so that night when Jason came back from work, he left the Dybbuk box in his truck covered up in his driveway. And so Jason goes inside, he has dinner with his family, and then he's sitting down in the TV room and he's watching TV with his son. And as they're watching TV quietly, Jason hears his son say, hey dad, who is that? And he looks over at his son and his son is pointing behind him. And Jason turns around and standing right behind him is the same woman who had come in his room with a shawl on that gouged his eyes out in his dream. And then she suddenly disappears. And Jason's looking at his son like, you just saw that too? And he's like, yeah, who was that? And so Jason grabs his son. He yells for his wife and says, we have to leave the house right now. His wife comes downstairs and she's like, what's going on? And he was like, I will explain in the car and we have to take your car. And so his wife sees how serious Jason is and she says, okay. And they get into her car and they drive down the road and that's when Jason explains what's going on with the Dybbuk box and how he and his son just saw the same woman that he had seen in his dream the night before that gouged his eyes and his eyes were red and his wife's starting to get really scared and his son's really scared of what's going on and so the solution they came up with was they were going to drive back to their house drop Jason off who was going to get in his truck where the Dybbuk box is still in the back it's still locked in the back of the truck and he's going to drive it a few miles outside of town to a rental property they owned that no one was staying in and he was 
going to put it in the basement. It was going to stay there until they figured out how to dispose of it because they didn't like the idea of just dumping it somewhere because they felt like if this is real and it's actually this cursed Dybbuk box, then somebody else is going to be cursed by this Dybbuk box unless we find a way or at least attempt to find a way to contain it and destroy it. And so Jason gets dropped off, he gets in his truck, he drives to the rental property, he puts it in the basement, he seals it up and he goes back to his house. Once Jason got back to his house, his wife and his son came back as well. And that night, Jason would go on eBay and he would find the contact information for Kevin, the original owner of the Dybbuk box after the estate sale. And he called him that night and Kevin actually picked up and the two of them spoke and Kevin ultimately agrees to help Jason find a way to properly dispose of this Dybbuk box. And what Kevin offers to do is drive back to the house where he had originally purchased this Dybbuk box and see if he can get some more information about what it is and what they do with it. The next day, Kevin, the antique shop owner, he goes back to the house where he originally bought the Dybbuk box at the estate sale. He knocks on the door and an old woman comes to the door and Kevin introduces himself and he says, hey, you know, I was here not too long ago and I purchased lot 29 that included that Dybbuk box and I wanted to know some more information about it. And the woman reacted and she's like, you know, I told my family not to sell that. I know what was inside of it and I know you're not supposed to open it. And I tried to tell my family and they didn't listen. I really hope you didn't open it. And Kevin's like, actually, yeah, I did open it. And he described all the horrible things that happened and he described selling it and all the subsequent owners, how they've had all these issues and how they've arrived at this place now where Jason in Missouri is having all these issues and they're trying to find a way to dispose of it. And that's when Sophie describes what's actually inside of this box. Sophie said she lived in Poland before World War II with her cousin Havila, who was the woman who had passed away and all her things were being sold at the estate sale. And she said that at the time, it was all the rage to have seances and try to talk to dead people and spirits, and they would just do it for fun. Sophie, Havila, and their mother, they would just, they would do this for fun. And Havila had made this Ouija board where she had stitched letters onto this blanket and they put it over this table and they would all hold this pendant that was suspended by a chain and they would ask questions and they would hope that, you know, a spirit that they were interacting with would interact with this chain and it would swivel around the pendant and it would point to the different letters whenever they asked a question and it would spell out, you know, whatever their answer was. And Sophie said, nothing ever happened. It was just kind of a fun thing for them to do. But one time it did work and they said the chain would go rigid and it would point over and over and it would spell the words, release me, release me, release me. Sophie said the women were incredulous and didn't believe it at first, but then they started to worry that if they didn't help this thing, that if it were a Dybbuk and were a malevolent spirit, they would find a way to attach itself to one of them. And so Sophie said they devised this ritual where they released it, but into this wine box that they were able to shut and lock. And that wine box became the Dybbuk box and that Dybbuk box is the same one that was sold to Kevin. Kevin told Sophie that, what do we do? We've already opened it up. And she said, you need to contact a rabbi. And so they would call a rabbi and apparently they were able to reclaim the Dybbuk inside of the box and lock it and put it away in a secret location where it's been since 2003. And apparently since it's been sealed off, Jason and Kevin have said they've experienced no demonic activity and they never plan to tell anybody where this thing is because they don't want anyone else to have even the opportunity to reopen the Dybbuk box and have to deal with all the horrible things that they want. In 2008, Brandon Swanson was a 19-year-old college student enrolled in a community college in a little town in Minnesota called Canby. The town had a population of less than a thousand people. He lived in Marshall, Minnesota, which was about 30 minutes away and was only slightly larger than Canby. Brandon was in his sophomore year at the community college and planned at the end of the year to transfer to a much larger four-year university where he would complete his degree. On the last day of classes that year, on May 13th, Brandon and some of his friends decided to go out and celebrate because not only did they now have this nice vacation but for Brandon it was a big deal he was getting ready to transfer to that larger school so that night Brandon met up with his friends kind of near where they went to school there was a couple different backyard barbecue type college parties going on and Brandon was having a good time with his friends and at some point a little after midnight he decided he was just ready to go home. He was tired. Instead of taking the preferred route, which would have been Highway 68 back to his home in Marshall, Minnesota, he decided to take some back roads. Later, when police were interviewing some of the people that were at those two backyard parties that Brandon had attended, 
They asked how much was Brandon drinking? And they all said that Brandon wasn't really drinking at all. We saw him with one beer that he wasn't really drinking and it seemed like he really was just tired. He wasn't looking to party and he left and seemed very sober. As Brandon is taking these back roads back to his home in Marshall, Minnesota, he ends up getting into a minor accident, but his car gets stuck in the ditch. So he can't get his car out of the ditch. He's totally stranded. The first thing he does is he calls his friends that were at the parties with him, but no one's picking up their phone. So at some point, you know, he's probably pretty embarrassed. He ends up calling his parents and says, hey, I'm totally fine but I'm letting you know I got into an accident. I'm near Lind, Minnesota. Here's the directions of how to get here. I need you guys to come out here and help me get out of the ditch. And so Brandon's parents say, okay, you know, we'll come out and meet you. They use Brandon's directions to get out to this area right near Lind, Minnesota, which was only about 10 minutes away from Marshall, Minnesota, where they lived. They make their way over to the spot and Brandon's father calls Brandon and says, hey, we're here. I'm gonna start flashing my lights as I drive down this road that you've sent us to. And so Brandon's like, okay, I'm looking for you. I don't see you, but I'm looking for you. He had given them really specific directions to where he was. And while they stay on the phone with each other, Brandon's father would flash his lights repeatedly and drive all around the area that had been described as where Brandon was. When Brandon keeps saying that he can't see their car, he doesn't see their lights, he begins to describe again how to get to where he is. And he's telling his parents, did you turn on this road? Did you come down this way? Are you near Lind, Minnesota? Are you sure you're where you need to be? And his parents would respond, are you sure you're giving the right directions? Because we're here, we're flashing our lights and you don't see us. At this point, Brandon gets in his car and he starts doing the same thing, flashing his lights. Granted, he can't move his car, so it's only one direction, but he's flashing his lights and he's telling his parents, do you see me? I'm flashing my lights. And they both were unable to see each other. Both parties being very frustrated with each other, Brandon just says to his father, listen, I'm gonna just walk to Lind. I can see the lights right there. I have a friend in Lind that can probably help me get my car out of here. I'm just gonna walk over there. It's probably like a 30 minute walk to Lind. I'm gonna walk towards the lights. Later, when police interviewed Brandon's father, Brandon's father would say, it did not seem like Brandon was drunk. It didn't seem like he was confused. He seemed totally lucid and very easy to talk to. We were having a very normal conversation. Brandon's father stays on the phone with Brandon and for 47 minutes, Brandon walks down this, this gravel road away from his car on the phone with his father. His father's just waiting for him to get to Lynn so he can you know, breathe a sigh of relief, make sure his son's okay. And as he's walking towards these lights that Brandon believes is the town of Lind, Brandon all of a sudden goes, oh shit! And then the phone cuts out. Brandon's father's like, what just happened? Tries calling him back, no answer. Brandon's father and his mother start driving all over the place, yelling out their window for Brandon, and they can't find him. They end up calling the police, who use Brandon's phone records to generally figure out where he had been when he was on the phone with Brandon's father. And it turns out he was nowhere near Lind. He was 25 miles away in a town called Taunton. So this huge search is launched for Brandon and there's no sign of him. They never get in touch with him on the phone. They never find his phone. They never find anything to do with Brandon. He just disappeared after seeing something on the road after walking towards some set of lights that he thought was Lind, but it wasn't, it was Taunton. But was he really walking towards town or, or what was it? What were the lights he was walking towards? To this day, Brandon's family leaves their front porch light on in hopes that someday Brandon will just show up again. In 1953, Ronald Tommen was a sophomore at Miami University in Ohio. He was a business major and he was living in a dorm room inside of Fisher Hall. Fisher Hall was a converted insane asylum and all the students there believed that Fisher Hall was a haunted dorm. It was one of those places where you tried to stay away from if you could. On April 19th of that year, Ron was in his dorm room inside of Fisher Hall. It was very snowy outside. He was listening to the radio and reading a book. At 8 p.m., he must have thought about getting into bed and when he did, he pulled back the sheets and found that someone had left a dead fish in his bed. And so at 8 p.m., there was an official request from Ron to get new sheets sent up to his room. At about 8.30 p.m., we don't know what it was, but something disturbed Ronald enough to where he ran out into the hall. We don't know what it was. People think it was a disturbing sound or someone yelling for help. We don't know. It's totally speculation, but something alerted him so quickly that he dropped everything he was doing. He left the radio on, lights on, book open, all of his ID cards, his wallet, everything, his shoes, 
everything stayed in his room and he ran out into the hall. When his roommate came back at 10 p.m., the door to the room was open and he saw that all of Ronald's things were just laying out, the lights were on, but there was no sign of Ron. Okay, maybe he left and went to his frat house because Ron was a part of a frat. But the next day when he couldn't get in touch with Ron, he ended up telling authorities that his roommate had been missing since the night before. When police began investigating, they saw that he had been studying a psychology textbook before he ran out into the hall and he had actually dropped the only psychology course he was taking three weeks earlier. His car was still parked right outside the dorm. There was still a couple hundred dollars inside of his bank account. And because he had not taken anything from his room, people believe he basically left in a t-shirt and shorts with no money, no shoes, no anything. A woman living 12 miles away from the campus would later report that the same night he went missing, a man looking like Ronald Tommen, matches description exactly, showed up at her door. And she opened the door and she said he was visibly frightened. He kept looking around like something was after him, but he seemed very upset. He was totally disheveled. He didn't have a jacket on. He didn't have shoes on. There was no car outside of her house. So this kind of crazy looking guy comes up to the door and he says, you got to tell me where the bus stop is. I got to get out of here. Where's the bus stop? And she pointed down the road. He immediately turned and he ran away. And that was the last anybody saw of him. Five months before Ron ran out of his dorm room to investigate some sound in the hall or whatever it was in the hall, he had gone to a coroner's office to ask to have his blood typed. And the coroner said in 35 years, he's never had someone come to him and ask him to do a blood type for them. Ronald could have just gone to a local physician on campus to do that for him. So it seems strange that he would have gone to a coroner of all people to get his blood typed. Tommen's parents said they spoke to him a week before he went missing, and they said there was nothing unusual about him. He seemed like he was happy, well-adjusted. He had no clear stress in his life. It just didn't add up. To this day, no one knows where he is, and no one knows what he heard in the hall that made him run out and then ultimately vanish. In 2006, Brian Schaefer was a 27-year-old medical student at Ohio State University. He had just lost his mother to a battle with cancer. He was feeling very down. And so his roommate, Clint, decided it would be a good idea on April 1st, which was the end of their classes, there was a little bit of a break coming up, that they should go out and just take his mind off of what he was dealing with and go out to a bar and have a good time. Brian agrees, and so on April 1st, the two of them make their way to the Ugly Tuna Bar, which was located in downtown Columbus, Ohio. Just before 10 p.m. that night, Brian stepped away from the Ugly Tuna to make a phone call to his girlfriend. Her name was Alexis, and she was also a medical student at Ohio State. On the call, there were some niceties exchanged. He said he loved her, and that would be the last time she ever heard his voice. After Brian came back into the bar, Brian and Clint decide they want to leave the Ugly Tuna and do a little bit of bar hopping. So they go to a couple different bars right outside and eventually meet up with one of Clint's friends named Meredith. The three of them continued bar hopping until Brian and Clint decided they wanted to go back to the Ugly Tuna. Meredith offered to drive. So they drive back to the Ugly Tuna and at about 1.15 in the morning, security cameras right outside the Ugly Tuna pick up the trio walking into the bar. At about 2 a.m., that same camera picks up Brian Schaefer stepping out of the bar and speaking to two college-aged females before at some point saying goodbye to them and walking back into the bar. At some point between 1.15 when the trio arrived and 2 a.m. when Brian is seen alone outside with those two other girls, Brian and Clint and Meredith got separated. Clint and Meredith tried calling him. They tried yelling for him. They couldn't find him. They assumed he must have got tired and just left the bar at some point because he only lived six blocks away. And if he wanted to, he could walk home. So they don't think much of it. And they ultimately leave the bar to head home themselves. The following day, Brian's girlfriend, Alexis, tried giving Brian a call, but it went straight to voicemail. She figured he could be sleeping off a hangover. So she didn't think much of it. But as she called him all day long and never got through, she started to become worried and asked Brian's father, Randy, if he could swing by Brian's apartment and just check in on him. When Randy arrived, Brian was not there, but his car was there and his apartment looked untouched. The bed was still made. There wasn't any signs of Brian having been there recently. At this point, Randy communicates with the police who immediately launch a huge search for Brian. And the police, they review the footage from the Ugly Tuna and it shows Brian along with Clint and Meredith making their way into the Ugly Tuna at 1.15 in the morning. Then it shows Brian 
leaving at 2 a.m. to speak to those two college girls that were outside the bar, but then he goes back into the ugly tuna. There is no video footage after that of Brian ever leaving the ugly tuna. There was one other exit from the ugly tuna that was not covered by a camera. However, it was under very heavy construction and in no way appeared to be a regular exit. It was completely blocked by construction materials and there was no sign that Brian had ever even gone near that exit from all of the other cameras inside. Police went to surrounding buildings that had cameras pointed in any way near the ugly tuna to try to pick up some sign of Brian leaving the bar after 2 a.m., but there weren't any. It was like he went into the bar and never left. And they searched the ugly tuna. They looked everywhere. He was not there. To this day, no one has any idea what happened to Brian. Is he still inside the bar? And if he left the bar, how are there no cameras anywhere that are able to pick that up? There was lots of cameras looking at the bar and looking outside the bar. How did he vanish without anybody knowing? Unfortunately, we probably will never know what happened to Brandon Swanson, Ronald Tommen, or Brian Schaefer. But that doesn't mean we can't speculate. So I'd love to hear what you think happened in each of these three cases. I'll do my best to respond to as many comments as I possibly can. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more videos like this one, I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to steal the like button's computer mouse, turn it over, and tape a small piece of paper to the underside, turn it back over, and then hide and make fun of the like button when their mouse doesn't work. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly three, four, even five video uploads that sound an awful lot like the one you just heard today. If you want to get in touch with me, you can send me a direct message on Instagram. My handle is johnballin416. I'm also very active on TikTok, where my handle is Mr. Ballin. And if you have a story suggestion for me to use on this channel, please submit it to the subreddit called Mr. Ballin. So no matter where I see you, whether it's on Reddit, Instagram, TikTok, or here on YouTube or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. I love making these videos and until next time see you. and if i never make it home no it never makes me sad i know my heart will never get better but i feel it getting better here i with you everybody tell them all together we can save the world Forget all the sad songs This is our year And we had no fear I felt so sad and I felt so found I felt so sad and I felt so found And if I never make it home No, it never makes me sad I know my heart Better, but I feel it getting better Here I with you As many of you may know, the biggest event ever to come out of Ballin Studios is fast approaching. From September 26th to October 20th, I will be on tour. I'll be visiting 15 cities across the United States, telling strange, dark, and mysterious stories live and in person. Last year, we did one show. It was a sold out show in Austin, Texas to kind of trial run this concept. And it's basically just me on stage telling stories and people loved it. And there was huge demand for more. And so here we are doing 15 more shows. Tickets for these 15 shows have been selling very quickly, but there are still tickets available if you act basically right now. All you have to do is go to tour.ballinstudios.com, find the show that is, you know, nearest you or whichever one you're interested in, click on the link, and if there are tickets still available, you can buy them through that link. And if you're lucky, there might even be some VIP tickets left, which will give you access to meet this guy, if that's of interest to you. Also, just for our VIP ticket holders, bring your copy of our graphic novel and I'll sign it for you when we meet. And so the way you get the book is either you have already pre-ordered it or you can buy a copy at the theater. We'll be selling them on site. Again, I'm gonna be on tour from September 26th to October 20th, telling stories in person. It's gonna be great. If you wanna go, there are still tickets, but they're going quick. Just go to tour.ballinstudios.com and get your tickets today. Okay, back to the stories. Before I became a professional strange, dark, and mysterious storyteller, I served in the military. And during my time in the military, I had some pretty wild experiences, 
But what I remember most about my time in service was not my own stories, but rather the stories I heard from other service members. Keep in mind, service members are sent to some of the most isolated and treacherous places in the world that very few people go to. And so some of the stories that come out of those places are totally creepy and weird. And even more than that, a lot of these stories sort of stay in house. They stay in the military just because it's kind of a cultural thing. You know, people don't necessarily want to go out and tell the world about the totally unsettling and inexplicable thing they saw while they were deployed. It's like people might think they were crazy, but there's lots of stories like that. And so if hearing some of those crazy military stories appeals to you, well, boy, do I have a podcast for you. It's called Wartime Stories, and it's hosted by Luke LaManna, who himself is a veteran. He was a reconnaissance Marine, which I can tell you is kind of a big deal. And so because he has access and placement, he's been able to extract some of these stories from the military and he shares them on the show. And if you wanted to kind of generalize the types of stories you're gonna hear on this podcast, it's like the strange, dark and mysterious meets the battlefield and beyond. The Wartime Stories podcast is free and it's available on any podcast platform. So all you have to do is, you know, go to your favorite platform and look up Wartime Stories, or you can search for Ballin Studios because it's produced under Ballin Studios. You Click on the show, give it a follow, and boom, you can start your bench. New episodes drop every Monday, so if you're a fan of The Strange, Dark, and Mysterious, well, you got yourself a brand new weekly show. So that's going to do it. If you enjoyed today's stories and you're looking for more Strange, Dark, and Mysterious content, well, you're in luck because we have a whole slew of Strange, Dark, and Mysterious podcasts under the Ballin Studios umbrella. We have the Mr. Ballin podcast, Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries. We have Wartime Stories, Bedtime Stories. We got Run Full. They're all free. They're all awesome. You got to go check them out. Go to any podcast platform and just look up Ballin Studios and boom, you'll see all our podcasts. That's hundreds of hours of free content to binge right now. Thank you so much for the support. Until next time, see ya. So that's going to do it, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's story. If you found the secret in today's video, please tell us in the comments section and tell us where you found it. So what's the timestamp? And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, at the next solar eclipse, please give the like button a pair of cardboard flimsy children's 3D glasses and tell them with these on, you can look directly at the solar eclipse and be totally safe. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It is linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.